Shalom. This is Dottie the Bantu Prophetess. Welcome to Try You See. The restoration of Jacob's unity continues where the Bantu comes to life. Let us pray. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. He has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation, my Yeshua, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now I will be reading the 10 words taken from Deuteronomy or Devarim in Hebrew, chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. And it reads, Ayah Yahweh, so nini nanini, your Bantu Elohim Tiko, Jacob out of the land of Ham, Egypt, from the house of bondage. You, Bantu, shall have no other Elohim before you. You, Bantu, shall not make you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. You, Bantu, shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For Ayah Yahweh, so nini nanini, your Bantu, Tiko, Yahweh, am a jealous Tiko visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing kindness to thousands of them that love me and keep my ten words. You, Bantu, shall not take the name of Yahweh, so nini nini, your Bantu, Tiko, Yahweh, in vain. For Yahweh, so nini nini, will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day, to sanctify it, as Yahweh, so nini nanini, your Bantu, Tiko Yahweh, has commanded you, Bantu. Six days you, Bantu, shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh, so nini nanini, your Bantu, Tiko Yahweh. In it you shall not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your ox, nor your ass, nor anything, nor any stranger that is within your gates, that your manservant and your maidservant may rest as well as you, Bantu. And remember that you, Bantu, were a servant in the land of Ham, Egypt, and that Yahweh, so nini nanini, your Bantu, Tiko, Yahweh, brought you out there through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, Yahweh, so nini nini, your Bantu Tiko, Yahweh, commanded you, Bantu, to guard the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother, as Yahweh, so nini nini, your Bantu Tiko, Yahweh, has commanded you, Bantu, that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you. In the land, South Africa, that Yahweh, so nini nini, your Bantu, Tiko Yahweh has given you. You Bantu shall not kill or murder. You Bantu shall not commit adultery. Neither shall you Bantu steal. Neither shall you Bantu bear false witness against your neighbor or your brother. Neither shall you Bantu desire your brother's wife. Neither shall you Bantu covet your brother's house his field, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his ass, or anything that is your Bantu's brother. That was taken this reading from Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 6 through 21. And now I will be doing the Itimba, that's um, is it closer for hope for those of you that may not um, think that you're hopeless and um, don't have anything in life to live for. Um, this is this was given to me as an anthem for the continent of Africa, and hopefully they will hear it and they will accept it as their national anthem. And so I begin singing it for you. Shalom be. In the entire continent of Africa, shalom be. In the entire continent of Africa, shalom be. Within the entire
to a continent of Africa. Shalom be within her walls. Shalom be within the walls of South Africa. Shalom be within the walls of South Africa. Shalom be within the walls of South Africa. Shalom be within her walls. May they that love you be in shalom. May they that love you be in shalom. May they that love you be in shalom. Shalom be within her May those that love so nini na nini be within you. May those that love so nini na nini be within you. May those that love so nini na nini be within you. Shalom be within your walls. And that reference for that can be found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 24 in the New Covenant or the Renewed Covenant. And um, let me see where I'm here. All right. Well, we're going to have the voice for today. And the voice of the day is the Bantu who loves or is zealous, supports his country, Africa. Understand what it means looking out for yourself by looking out for your country, Africa. Mesendisi, Savior, Yeshua, salvation, is someone who has given his life to something bigger than himself, Sonini Nanini, the Bantu father. He is the true hero. Okay, the announcements that I have today or dedication, I would like to dedicate this particular broadcast for the entire month of January to Sonini Nanini. And I'm going to explain to you what Sonini Nanini means so you have a better understanding. You won't think, oh, never heard of such a thing. Well, it's taken from the... Um, Kosa uh, dialect, and uh, most people don't know that the scripture, they were actually written in the Kosa dialect. It was transferred from Latin to um, Kosa, that's, it was first written, and I think it was 1824, I think I got that date correct. I didn't write it down in these notes, but I have it somewhere else, but nevertheless, this program will be dedicated to Sonini Nanini. In the Kosa dialect, so equals Bantu father. So when you say so, and I notice a lot of people um, in our society, they'll begin a sentence like, well, so, and every time I hear them say so, I say to myself, I said, oh, that's the Bantu father. And Nini means I am, and Na means that. And Nini means I am. So he is the I am that I am. So Nini Nanini, the Bantu father, I am that I am. And if you notice, I'm going to be reading for you so you will understand that that's when Moshe, in the, in the Old Covenant, when the father had spoke to him, and he asked him, he said, uh, who shall I say sent me? So I'm going to go over to uh, Shemot, or Exodus, in, in the Old Covenant, Chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, and um, let you hear what the Almighty said to uh, Moshe when he inquired about who should he tell that sent him. So like I said, I'm going to be reading Bersh or excuse me, Shemot chapter uh, 
3, verses 11 through 15, and it reads, And Moshe said unto Tico, Tico is another name in the Kosa dialect also for God. So Tico is God, Yahweh, all right? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Chapter 3 of Bereshit, I keep saying Bereshit, I don't want to know why I want to go to Genesis, but in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, it reads, And Moshe said to Tico Yahweh, Who are, who am I, excuse me, that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children, the Bantu children, of Jacob out of Ham, or Egypt. And he said, certainly, a Yah will be with you. And that's the other good thing, I'll pause right there. When you know that the Father is with you, Sonini is with you, you don't have to fear no man or anything, because you know, he's the one that actually gives you life, eternal and he's watching over you he knew he orchestrates our steps and everything so i just want to encourage you to be aware that you're never alone and that's one of uh, from i have original song that says about never being alone when you know the father's with you when everybody else turns their back on you that's one thing you can count on it is him being with you okay verse 12 and he said certainly a will be with you and this shall be a token or a sign to you that a Yah have sent you when you have brought forth the people, the Bantu people. And that's another thing. Bantu just means people, by the way. So, out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, you shall serve Tiko Yahweh upon this mountain. And Moshe said to Tiko Yahweh, Behold, when I come to the children, of Yaakov, and shall say to them, the Tiko Yahweh of your Bantu fathers, or your Bantu Tata, Tata is a word for fathers, but I'm going to try to keep it in English as much as I can because I have a habit of doing that. So, verse 13 again, and Moshe said to Elohim, or Tiko Yahweh, behold, when I come to the children of Yaakov, and shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And Tiko Yahweh said to Moshe, Ayah, or I am that I am, so Nini, or that is Nini, na Nini. And he said, Thus shall you say to the children, the Bantu children of Yaakov. Nini has sent me to you, or I am. Nini is I am. So that's a bit of Kosa that, you know, every now and then I try to implement it when I'm reading the scripture. You'll hear Hebrew, you'll hear uh, English, and you will also hear the Kosa that I'm learning from some of the, the passages. So, And verse 15, and Elohim Tiko, Yahweh said, Moreover to Moshe, thus shall you say to the children of Yaakov, Yahweh Tiko, Yahweh Sonini Nanini, of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yaakov, and the Elohim of, excuse me, the Elohim of Yaakov, Tiko of Yaakov, start over verse 15. Elohim Tiko said, moreover, unto Moshe, Thus shall you say to the children of Yaakov, Yahweh, so nini nini, Tiko Yahweh of your fathers, the Tiko of Abraham, the God of Abraham, the Tiko of Yisak, or ya uh, Isaac, and the Tiko, or Yahweh of Yaakov, Jacob, has sent me, to you that I may lead you forever a memorial unto all generations. Excuse me, and this shall be my name for all generations. All right, for memorial. 
So um, I was stumbling over my scriptures there. I have a habit of doing it when I get excited, so I hope that you bear with me. But that's what Sononi, Sonini Nanini means in the Kosa dialect. So equals Bantu Father, Nini equals I am. And this is dedicated to the Almighty Yahweh Sonini Nanini. All righty. And um, I just want to lift to you the topic, uh, if you remember just this thing, that when you see in the scriptures, um, he, because, you know, I, I had did a podcast and letting the people know that uh, Lucifer is a female and not a male. And also she could be as an hermaphrodite also, which both has the female and male organs. And, um, and what it had dawned on me that what possibly what they had done is that he in Hebrew is actually she. And that's a he, a yod, and an aleph. So when you hear that he, when they refer to Satan in the scriptures as he, they were referring possibly as she because he in Hebrew is she. And, the, and how you say he in Hebrew is who. Who in Hebrew is he, but he in Hebrew is she. So if you can just keep that in mind when reading the scriptures, when you run across Lucifer in the scriptures or Satan, you, you won't be confused because, you know, Venus, it's she's the goddess and goddesses aren't male, they're female. So, and Lucifer is the goddess of Venus. So, and also of Roman Catholicism or Roman and Greek mythology. So just keep that in mind as you read through the scripture. And that uh, you won't be confused when you say, because most, most ministers, they, they don't know Hebrew. A lot of them don't. They can barely speak English. And um, they just, they're just gung-ho thinking that, you know, Lucifer is a he. But no, in, in the Ibrit or Hebrew, it's actually he is she. And likewise with the Ruach HaKodesh or the, I learned a new name in, in Kosa, it is um, Umoya. That's how you say spirit in, in, in Kosa, but the Holy Spirit, he, it's a he because it's the spirit of Sonini Nainini. So just keep those two things in mind as you read through the scriptures and it will make a lot more sense to you because there was a lot of changes that went on in the scriptures that most believers are unaware of because when you have somebody um, trying to replace you or pretend that they are you, that's why we have a law in, in, in the Americas right now concerning not just in Americas, but throughout the earth of what they call identity theft, where someone is always trying to take your identity. And so it's nothing new with, with what, how they've done scripture to try to cover and justify their wrongs because they're, you know, when you have a thief, a thief, they actually work hard to keep what they have. And um, so, but on with my, I digressed a bit from my notes there. So, and we're going to, talk a little bit about now um, what I'm actually here to talk about and I I want to give this little um, disclaimer for parents that may have uh, small children this this topic that I want to discuss because it's it's uh, most people aren't really aware of it but I think it's not a good thing if you have small children that um, you know it's I, I believe strongly that it's to the parents discretion of what their children should and should not a glean up on and what is acceptable. I'll leave that in, to the family. You know, the I don't want to take any authority from the parents in that regards, but I want to leave the authority where it belongs because the almighty Sonini Nanini has given that authority to parents just like no one has authority over a parent, children, but that parent, and that's given from heaven. The judges don't have authority over the parents' children. Neither do the law enforcement have authority over the parents' children. Unless they violate the laws, then there's a law that they have to give an account to. But other than that, parents have authority that was given to them from heaven. And it's best to um, hold on to the authority that the Almighty has given you, and you will be just fine. All right, well, our topic today is the dangers of self-gratification. And first of all, I'm going to give you the definition of uh, what self-gratification actually is, and it will be taken from my Webster's Dictionary. So according to my Rosette Webster's Dictionary, the definition of self-gratification. Self is just simply the individual identity 
personal welfare or interests, not so Nini Nini centered. And it is identical of the same. Um, it could be homosexual, which means, you know, same sex. And then for gratification is enjoyment, satisfaction, indulgence, uh, a reward or payment, such as, you know, a woman that's a woman of the night or a prostitute, she gets payments. And also re, I uh, hope I say this correctly, remuneration or reward to pay. You know, it's still within the grounds of prostitution. So, and according to, um, now I'll give you the definition for the topic, which is Onaism. It's spelled O-N-A-N-I-S-M. And according to the Miller King Encyclopedia, that's King, K-E-A-N-E, -E, Encyclopedia and Dictionary of Medical, Nursing, and Allied Health, 7th edition, they give the definition of Onaism as coitus, that's where you have a, a sexual relationship, it's a coitus interruptus within the, let me make sure I get this correctly, uh, with, which, in which you withdraw your penis before ejaculation to prevent conception, okay? That's what coitus and interruptus is. It's where the male withdraws his penis from the female and to prevent conception. And then the second one is masturbation or original abortion. I want you to hold on to that one because masturbation is an original abortion. So most times what has happened is that people are so quick to blame the woman for aborting her child. But no, no, no. It begins with the man because if, if most people understand that the whole system is male dominant because that's the way the mighty almighty Sunini Nanini wanted it when he created Adam. And then he brought the woman because the woman Eve is it, just totally different. And, and besides, I don't know any woman that has named anything that that authority was given to the male. He named all the animals and he even named his own wife. So that's why I strongly hold to that as women. We don't have to chase after men. If it's meant in the heart for the father to give us away, they will seek. And a man who finds a, a good woman, a wise woman is a blessed man. And you can find a corrupt woman also. But anyway, so masturbation is the original abortion. Onan was the son of Judah. That's where they get Onanism from, from his name. And it was practiced, and he practiced it and was put to death for it. And I'm going to read to you now Genesis chapter 38, verse 1 through 30. And I want you, um, especially the males and the men out there, to really be considerate of what I'm about to say here, too, because... Um, a lot of times uh, we do things and we just do it out of ignorance and um, you actually cause more hurt than anything and that's this is actually a death sentence when you've heard that the, it said that the wages of sin is death well this is one of those incidents where the father Sunini Nanini the Almighty Yahweh he was not pleased with what neither Onan nor his brother had done because Judah had two sons that the father said he wasn't pleased with them and it was just a sad thing. So we're going to go over to Genesis chapter, um, uh, what did I say here? Genesis chapter 38, verses 1 through 30. And um, just read straight through here for you. Genesis 38, 1 through 30. It's the entire chapter. And, um, and it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned in to a certain Abdulamite, whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of the certain um, Canaanite, of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in to her. Now pay close attention because this is, he, he saw a woman it's like almost, I, I believe she may have been a prostitute, to be honest with you, because he saw her and he took her. It, was, it didn't say it was his wife, because normally it says when you, a man takes a woman, he's taken her as a wife, but evidently this was just a prostitute. So, and she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Er. And if you remember, too, this another good thing we're reading through the scripture. It's always 
of important for the male, the father, to name his children. And we've had some twisted incidents where it said, oh, well, the mother named the child, and the mother this and mother that. But normally it's the father that actually give the name to the child because he's the one that's the lead in his home. So verse 4, and she conceived and bare a son, excuse me, verse 3, and she conceived and bare a son and called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. That's where they get Onanism from, okay? And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. So she has three sons. And he was at Kezib when she bare him. Okay, I'm not going to give any uh, uh, history on the names or anything. I'm just going to read straight through the scriptures and let them speak for themselves. And Judah took a wife. This is another thing for fathers. You were responsible for finding a, a, a wife for your sons. And um, I'll just leave it at that. And so Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of Yahweh, Sonin and Anini. And Sonin and Anini slew him. See, that's, that's the, when, when father doesn't like you, he will kill you. So he will quickly put you to death. So that's an, an, an example for the man, because especially if he's angry with you, man, you can guarantee you will fall into the hands of a whore. OK, I'll say that he if he's angry with you, you will fall into the hands of a prostitute and she will take you straight to the bowels of hell. All right. And there's no return. That's why you have a lot of people committing suicide when they do an extramarital affair on their spouses or their um, significant ones. That, that's why it's always a suicidal thing, because they think it's no way out. And then to some extent, there isn't. So verse eight. And Judah said to Onan, go in to your brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to your brother. And see, he had to take her as a wife. He didn't just go sleep with her as a woman like he would a, a street woman. He took her because he saw value. A wife is more value than a street woman. And besides, you really got no satisfaction when you take a street woman because she never satisfies. She, she will never, never satisfy. You cannot get enough. That's why you'll keep coming back and coming back and coming back until you have nothing. So verse nine, and Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass, pay attention. This is where we're going to get into the, the um, spilling of his seed. Okay. And Onan knew that the seed or the, that he was conceiving in her should not be his. And it came to pass. When he went into his brother's wife, that's talking about coitus, that's sexually, he's sleeping with her sexually, coitus, that he spilled it on the ground. In other words, he did what the, the, the uh, dictionary from the uh, medical dictionary said, he did a coitus interruptus, a coitus interruptus, because he pulled out and didn't allow it to bring forth conception. Lest he should give seed to his brother. That's a very selfish person that does something like that also. He was supposed to bless his brother, and here his mind was very negative toward his brother. And besides, it was not necessarily towards the brother as much as to his creator, the almighty Sunini Nanini, that he did that. And the thing which he did displeased Yahweh. See, whatever you do, sin-wise or wrong, because sin, all wrongdoing is sin, period. So whatever you do, it's wrong. You're actually sinning against the one that made you, right? Okay, wherefore he slew him. God, God killed him. God killed him also. So don't, you know, when you see these different shootings and murders on the screen of your television, a lot of it is justified no matter how unjust as it seems. It, God is in control of everything. So then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow at your father's house till Shia, my son, be grown. For he said, lest preadventure he die also and his brethren as his brethren did, and Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Verse 12, and in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was com com comforted. Okay, so, so Judah is a single man now again, and that's the good thing about it. I'll say this pause right there because as I go through, I'm just trying to read through it as the Holy Spirit would speak. He lets me see that's the best thing. That's the only time that a man, when you're married, you, you're free to actually get another wife. And let your spouse pass away first before you consider someone else. Or even if they should leave, let and if you have young children, let them grow up first before you seek out someone else and that your children won't be pressured to 
calling everybody mommy or daddy and 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 they're not even mature because they're still hurting too because that was their mother or their father or whatever you put it put in it to it so just be mindful um, when you when your spouse passes or or happens to leave you and you have small children okay verse 11 again then Judah said to Tamar his daughter-in-law remain a widow at your father's house till she and my son be grown for he said lest peradventure he die also as his brother did and Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house she returned back that single woman can return home no children so and in the process of time the daughters of Shea Judah's wife died and Judah was comforted and went up to his to his sheep shearing in Timnah he and his friend Hira the Adulamite and it was told to excuse me and it was told to Tamar saying behold your father-in-law goes up to Timnah to shear his sheep and she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her head covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which is by the way to Timnah for she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given to him to wife now you see you often hear people say well dress doesn't have anything to do with a woman no your attire says a lot about you you can dress like a prostitute and you may not even be a prostitute but when men see you that's what they conceive you and if you notice the majority of women that get raped the majority of time is those that carry themselves in such a way so and you're going to see as I continue to read here that um, uh, Judah actually thought that Tamara was a prostitute by her dress and your dress does say something to you and as believers we have to be mindful because we have to dress modestly it's not that you go around looking like an old maid or hag or anything like that but with modesty we have to we have to conduct ourselves so verse 15 and Judah saw her and he thought listen to what I'm about to say he thought her to be a harlot and it was all based on what she looked like which she looked because men are very visual and most women don't understand that and and they're marketing themselves and, and they're actually causing the man to stumble and that's one thing the scripture says not for us to cause our brother to stumble or put a stumbling block before uh before a blind person it's it, it's wickedness it's not a good thing it's it's not good and so and because he said he thought she was she had covered herself so that's what evidently that's what prostitutes did they covered themselves a certain way and presented themselves to the public a certain way so but it is a business you know like they they're given the Almighty Yahweh has placed prostitute and whores in the earth for his for his work to to bring about his judgment and his wrath upon those men who refuse to obey him and do what he's called them to do he's called them to be leaders he's called them to be examples he's called them to be the head he's called them to be our protectors he's called them to be his ambassadors his warriors and when they refuse to do that, then they fall into the hands of a whore or a prostitute, so a harlot. So, verse sixteen, and he turned unto her by the way and said, "Go to, I pray you, let me come in to you." In other words, he wants to have a relationship with her courteously, for he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. That's amazing. He didn't even recognize his own daughter-in-law just because of the way she dressed, and she's a widow at that. So. And she said, what will you give me? What will you give me that I, that you may come in to me? And see, that's like I said, prostitution, a harlot. That's, uh, that's work. That's a job for them because they're doing the work that Father has given them. The Almighty Yahweh has given a woman this ability. So, you know, all I say is that that's her, that's her profession. That's how she makes her living. And um, that's what they'll do. They'll take everything you got and leave you with nothing because you'll never be satisfied with something that is not yours. And he said, I will send you a kid, or that's a young goat, from the flock. And she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give you? And this I want you to pay attention here to because there's a lot of teachings going around saying that we cannot wear jewelry, where well, I beg to differ. Not only do we wear jewelry, but it's a sign of who you are and your status in society, especially when you're royalty and when you hold that authority. Okay, because you know, even back then, the kings, they wore rings because they had a signet ring to, to finalize their, 
their uh, approval like we have little stamps here now and not only that but a man when he takes a wife he's supposed to give her a sign of a signal that she belongs to him so he puts a ring on her finger not in her nose not in her ears and he will put bracelets on her arms and it's just not any cheap thing too it's it's like it's the most precious thing gold or diamonds so I just want to let you know that and pay close attention here because a lot of people are teaching well you know especially when the, I think they're called the Seventh-day Adventist movement and, and what that particular religion they prefer not to wear jewelry but yet I see them wearing watches it's like what what part of jewelry is not jewelry you know if you're not going to wear jewelry you don't wear watches you don't wear anything don't say you don't wear jewelry and then you have watches on so you know it's it's a double standard so let's let's get back to the reading here verse 16 again and he said unto her by the way and said go to I pray you and let me come in to, to unto you for he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law and she said what will you give me that you may come in unto me and he said I will send you a kid a goat a young goat from the flock and she said will you give me a pledge till you send it in other words she didn't trust him you know you I'm not gonna let you come into me and, and make a promise you know you got to give me something up in advance and she said and he said what pledge shall I give you it's like well what I'm gonna give you and she said your signet that's a ring okay like I was saying it's a ring it's a signet ring and your bracelets men wore bracelets too okay so it's a sign of, of a covenant between a husband and a wife remember he's a widow now all right and your staff that was your history you know all your history was written on that piece of wood your family tree that is in your hand and he gave it to her he didn't hesitate what you want I'll give it and I just want to lay with you I just want to lay with you and it came and he and came in to her coitus and she conceived by him okay verse 19 and she arose and went away and laid by laid by her veil from her and put on garments of her widowhood in other words she got back in her uh, normal clothes as you dress as a widow because widows dress a certain way in this time virgins dress a certain way and also prostitutes dress a certain way so and it just goes to show the holy women dressed a certain way also the prophetess dressed a certain way also and Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend verse 20 the Adulamite to receive a pledge from the woman the woman's hand but he found it not okay 34 minutes okay I already have to pause there for a bit. Then verse 21, he asked the men of that place saying, where is the harlot? Okay, so he thought his daughter-in-law was a harlot. So that was openly by the wayside. And they said, oh, by the way, I'm gonna stop right there, pause right there for a moment too, because I'll let you know, harlotry or whoredom or prostitution is not going anywhere anytime soon. So you can get that out of your mind, those who've been trying to shut down the brothels and prostitution. It will never go away until Yeshua, the Messiah of Nazareth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, come back in the clouds and he makes everything new. But until then, whores and prostitution were gone because they have to do the work of the Almighty to do with rebellious men who refuse to do what the Father says in living holy and righteous. Verse 22, and he returned to Judah and said I cannot find her and also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place you see so harlots are all female harlots are never males so there is a distinction there and remember what we're talking about is the dangers of self gratification all right and you're here with Dottie the Bantu prophetess all right and Judah said let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed. Behold, I sent this kid or this young goat, and you have not found her. Uh, I'm not going to go into, I'm just going to continue to read because I can go into detail. So, but anyway, verse 24, and it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Okay, 
what is it what do they call a woman that is not married and that that uh, ends up pregnant they call her harlot so fathers I suggest to you that you monitor your daughters and let them know that they're very special and that it, wait for the right one they don't have to just sleep with anybody that comes around but be more mindful of who they are as uh, daughters you know just they're beautiful women are beautiful so just you know you don't have to sleep around with everybody because that's how that's what they're talking about Tamar here they said she played the harlot not that she was one it's just by what she did and how she dressed to do what she did so but um and also behold she is with child by whoredom and Judah said bring her forth and let her be burnt that's a death penalty for harlots it's almost like when they had the Salem witch hunt they burnt all the witches they used fire to burn the witches and you remember the witches were female so that's why you know women carry a different spirit than those of most uh, the male counterparts so just a little insight there all right verse 25 when she was brought forth she sent to her father-in-law saying by the man whose these are this is a wise woman I tell you and I with child she didn't say with the baby that's another fallacy and and try to convince a woman to do away with her offspring is to say that oh that's just a blob and it's it's nothing to it no it's a child it didn't say it, it didn't say a baby it's a child all right it says she was pregnant with child not baby it's a child so all right and let me read verse 25 again when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man, I emphasize man, whose these are am I with child. And she said, Discern, I beg you, whose are these? The signet ring, the bracelets, and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, verse 26, She has been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. And he knew her no more. In other words, he learned from his mistakes. He didn't continue to sleep with her after he realized what he had done. And now that's a form of repentance because you need to repent. When you know you've done something wrong, you repent. And that means turn away. In other words, be sorry for your sin or your wrong and don't repeat it. Don't say, I re I'm so sorry for my sin. And you go repeat it again. No, you repent, you turn from it. And you get away from around those that may cause you to go in that direction again, you know. So, and he gave verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her travail, and other words, she was about to give birth, that behold, twins were in her womb. All right, it's a beautiful thing. Twins in the womb. Hallelujah. And it came to pass, verse 28, when she travailed that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, a red thread saying, this came out first. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold, his brother came out and she said, how have you broken forth? This breach is upon you. That's almost like a curse. It's like, wait a minute, you weren't supposed to come out first. You, you pushed your brother back and you know, took his place. That wasn't right. Therefore, his name was called Pharez. Verse 30. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread or the red thread upon his hand. And his name was called Zara. So I just read to you uh, Genesis, the entire chapter, verse 38. You can read it again for yourself at a later time. And um, we're going to continue on. And we're talking here about Onaism. And you're, it was the... Uh, dealing with the topic of the dangers of self-gratification. And I just want to let you know you're here with Dottie, the Bantu prophetess. And um, I'm going to continue on here. And I want to say emphatically, without any hesitation, that masturbation, and on, which is onanism, is the root cause of man's rebellion and his damnation leading to hell. That's the root cause. And these, I'm going to give you some examples what I've discovered about this. And like I said, all wrongdoing is sin. 
but he who sins does wrong his body. And he who sins, that does wrong his body, and he wrongs his soul also. So it's one thing to sin outside of the body, but when you sin against your body, you know, with your body, you, you, you hurt your soul. Okay. And that, that's the reference out of Colossians chapter uh, 3 in the New Covenant, the Renewed Covenant. I'm going to go over and read that for you. And uh, Colossians chapter 3. Verse 25. So get over there. Colossians 3:25. And uh, it reads here. But he that does wrong shall receive for the wrongs which he has done. And there is no respect of persons. So there you have it. That the wrongs you do against your body, it's 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 a it's not too good. So and, you know, Yahweh Sunni told us what to do in order to enjoy and have pleasure in this life. And it is found in the Ten Words, or um, Deuteronomy, as you heard at the beginning of the program, the reading of the Ten Words from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. And also there's another reference that I read in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 9 through 10 for you, to give you a better, uh, another Form of insight here concerning um, how the Father has showed us what we need to do in order to enjoy life and have true pleasure in life. Because if we just learn to do it how He says it, we won't have the problems. And and that's what I notice about our society. It's a tendency because we know that Lucifer is the god of this of this 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 uh, world system. And that, you know, our flesh tends to always agree with her, but we have to remember that we're spirit. And that the almighty Sunini Nanini, when you um, repent and turn back unto him, he revives your spirit and your spirit becomes new in him. And you, you see life differently. So let me get over here. Uh, chapter 28 of Deuteronomy. Um, uh, and it reads verse 9 and 10. It says... Yahweh Sonini shall establish you and holy people to himself as he has sworn to you. If you shall guard or keep the ten words of Yahweh, your Elohim, Tiko, Yahweh, and walk in his ways, verse 10, and all people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of Yahweh, Sonini Nanini and they shall be afraid of you. So that's the authority, because anytime you're walking in authority, and that was, that's again from um, uh, Devarim, chapter 28, verses 9 through, 20, 9 through 10, that's in Deuteronomy, Devarim in Hebrew, verse 9 through 10, chapter 28. So, and um, all prostate cancer, hear me what I'm about to say, because I have not heard anyone say this, because this is a spiritual enlightenment that I have received that all prostate issues, all prostate issues are derived from the practice of masturbation of, or onaism. And these are some other things that follow behind that. Along with that, the masturbation practices, you end up with murder, you end up with rape, you end up with pornography, you end up with adultery, you end up with fornication, you end up with prostitution, homosexuality, bestiality, etc. You will never have true gratification because this is not Yahweh's Sunini Nanini's blueprint, but man's. And I want to give some examples about that because uh, on um, I was on the web there. I have a female, I have a female, a female, and then a male. There was a female teacher in Florida. It was Hollywood, Florida on the, you can look at the net yourself on the news, go back, and who actually presented to her classroom uh, a male's genital that was made out of gum wrappers. And that was very offensive to a lot of parents and everything that she'd done. And then she tried to blame it, said one of the students actually gave it to her for a gift, you know, which was very evil, you know, that she's supposed to be educating the children and to be productive and how to achieve and to be uh, honorable citizens. And here she is teaching them to be criminals and to be defiled and, and evil. 
And then there was another incident. It was another female. She was posting um, pornography uh, pictures on TikTok, you know, pornographic pictures on TikTok. And I don't go into detail about these things because I'll let you make your own judgment. So, and then there was a male. He was 23 years old, excuse me, 26 years old. And um, he was pretending that he was younger to lure a 13 year old male from Utah. And uh, the gentleman that lived, he actually lived in uh, Nebraska, but he actually somehow got over to Utah and convinced this 13 year old male to, that he wanted to have a relationship with him, but they got him also. So you can look into that all on your own. And um, it's just, like I said, that's the results of when you choose to go out the out of the Almighty's ways and um, you continue in Onaism or um, masturbation. And so it's just not it's just not the men. It's just not the men. It sounds like it's all men, but you know, women do that masturbation stuff too. And that's what I say. They be they be led away true because there's no true satisfaction unless you do it the way the Almighty does it. Because if you start a problem, you got to figure out a way to curtail that problem. And that, like I said, that's how our society. That's how within the Luciferian system works. You make a problem, and then you pretend you have a solution for the very problem that you caused. And then when you do that, and then yet it's a way to make money, because you'll find someone always making books. They'll make movies. They'll make records. They'll make everything out of the very thing that they started. So that's how they survive because that is a spirit of Cain. That is a spirit of Lucifer because when father cursed Cain, he said you would be a vagabond, you would be a fugitive. And if you notice at the beginning of the promo, I said there's only at the beginning of the program that there's only two kind of people. You have the Bantus, which are light, and you have Cain, which are darkness, people of darkness. It's only two people. So, and, um, and I want to, I'm just, when I say that, I, I just want to, say this before I continue on. I'm almost uh, getting through this particular stuff I have about, okay, 12 minutes left. So I just want to say this too, concerning the whole Black Lives Matter thing. People just hear me clearly. Black Lives Matter has nothing to do with color. That's dealing with witchcraft, with white witchcraft, black witchcraft. It's, that's dealing with the dark side. And when I brought that to, the gentleman's name was Larry Elders. I remember I went on his broadcast and I made reference to it and he like laughed at me and hung up on me. And then I, I told the people it has nothing to do with color. It has to do with, with the dark side. Those who do witchcraft and those who do sat Satanism and stuff, they wanted to be recognized. And so that's where we are because they know that in the last days that the wicked would go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's just where we are. Either you're going to, and Yeshua said, keep on doing what you're doing until I come. You want to live in darkness? Keep on doing it. Just like when, when Noah got on that, on that ark. You know, and he told me it's going to rain. He was preparing the people, just like I'm preparing you. I'm warning you ahead of time. So when it happens, you can't say no one told you or no one didn't tell you, excuse me. Because you know, you know now that uh, you're either going to walk in light or you're going to walk in dark. And you can't continue to do the same thing. So continuing on, a woman who does this, which is onaism or masturbation, is not a virgin. So a woman, if you have practiced onaism or masturbation, you're not a virgin, right? You are a whore or a prostitute. And you can find that reference in Deuteronomy chapter 22. I'm not going to read it. Chap Deuteronomy, Deborim in the Hebrew, chapter 22, verses 13 through 21. All right. And a man who does this is not a virgin. He's a dog. And you can find that reference in Deuteronomy or Deborim chapter 23, verses 17 through 18. They're not a virgin. And if you know anything about the revelation, it says that there will be 144,000 male virgins. It's still possible for a male to be a virgin, especially the young boys that are growing up now. They can still be virgins. Just keep to themselves. They don't, you know, not, not tamper with anybody. So most people don't know that there are male virgins. They don't touch women and you, you don't the vice versa with the woman. You don't touch men, anything that's not yours. So it's possible. But if you're masturbating and if you're doing onlyism, you are destroying your virginity. You're no longer virgins. You're either a prostitute if you're female or a whore or you're a dog if you're male. There's only two ways. OK. And it says a man who takes another man's wife. Hear me out when I say this. A man who takes another man's wife in marriage can cause infertilities, okay? They can cause infertility, 
Most people don't know that. They think, oh, I'm just going to divorce and, and just go be with this man. No, you're going against what the scripture says. You don't remarry unless your spouse is asleep or passed on. Otherwise, you're still bringing um, curses to yourself, and that one that is doing it is bringing curses also. It's the male, because he's the one that carries a seed. And if you're in a disobedience, and, and because he's under the Father's curse, he won't be able to produce like he's supposed to, because both of you, he's, you're entering both into a curse. So I just want to put that before you. And you can find that reference in verse sheet or Genesis chapter 20, verses 17 and 18. I will read this one for you, so you'll see that I'm just not talking off the top of my head as I encourage you to turn back and to be all that you can be in the eyes of your Creator because He loves you so much, so much, and that there's nothing can separate you from His love. When He made you, He didn't make a mistake. Genesis chapter um, 20, verses 17 through 18, and it reads, I have nine minutes here left, perfect. It reads in Genesis chapter 20, verse 17 through 18, it reads, so Abraham prayed to Yahweh. And Yahweh healed Abimelech and his wife and his manservant, and they bare children. And Yahweh had fast closed, excuse me, and Yah oh yeah, Yahweh had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. See, that's the doing of the father. He closed that woman's womb. She couldn't bear no children. That's why if a woman can't, if you're married to a woman that cannot bear children, don't be in a hurry. Just enjoy each other. Enjoy each other. If it's meant for her to have babies, the father, just as he closed that womb, he's able to open it. So don't, you don't have to do the vitriol and, and all that insemination, all this artificial stuff, because it's not natural. And I'll say this. I may get some backlash from it. And I may not, but people that say that they don't know what they are concerning in our society now being transgender, it's possible because if you're if they come through scientific means other than the way the fathers, they don't know who they are because there is not that when a man and a woman come together in coitus, they're being produced from a test tube or in some factory or taking some man's semen and putting it in another woman or doing. It's not natural, so don't fault these people that are struggling because they need their own restrooms. They need their own things because they don't. It's not like people talking about, well, I believe I feel like. It's not what you feel. It's those that have actually been through, and that's what society can do. They can determine those laws that those children, that they know who are born that way, to give them the right that is due them because that is due them because of what they've done. They've made it hard for them. So if they do that, and they, 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 you know your child was conceived in that way. It wasn't be, be between a man and a woman coming together the way the Almighty said to come together. But you did it scientifically, vitro in, in, insemination or some sperm bank. You need to let your son or your daughter know this so that they won't be confused as to who they are and how they came about. That's why they have these mixed feelings. And they deserve to have their own so-called restroom and their own little private space because they're, they're struggling emotionally. They're struggling mentally. That's the mental collapse that we have in our societies. And the people are just not making it up. They're not just feeling like and just trying to pretend like they just have mentally unstable. They're unstable because of how they were conceived because they went against the way the Almighty said he would do it. If you can't have children, women, don't do anything or men, don't force your wives or your daughters just enjoy each other because if it's meant the father just like he said here and i read in verse in genesis chapter 20 verse 19 and yahweh yahweh so nini nini had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of abimelech because of sarah abraham's wife so if you're sleeping around and and you you're you're cursing your family men and you know you wonder why your wife can't conceive or you know what she you know it's you got to look at yourself Look at yourself, because it's real. So, continuing on. Okay. Yahweh Sunini Nani is looking for holiness, set-apartness, obedience. Without such, no man shall see Yahweh Sunini Nani. And that is found in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Okay, I'm good on time there. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to read that quickly here. 
Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Here we go. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And um, But I'm not going to read the uh, Second Chronicles. I, oh, I can read that. I may have enough time for that, too. And, okay, verse chapter 22 of Revelation. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of Solini Nanini and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of and on either side of the river there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there was, and there shall, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of Yahweh and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Verse four, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Verse 5, and there shall be no more, and there shall be no night there, and they need no lamp, neither light for the sun, for Yahweh, Sunini Nanini, Elohim gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. When it says there will be no more night, night is remember night deals with Cain and the curse of Lucifer. Alrighty, so we'll go over to Second Chronicles 7.14. And then I'll give you guys an opportunity to receive the uh, the uh, the very one, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is our our hope and who is our salvation. And that's what Yeshua means in Hebrew. It means salvation. And in the Kosa, the Kosa dialect, it means that um, uh, it's descendancy, which is savior. So, chapter seven of Second Chronicles. Chapter 7, 2 Chronicles 11 through 14, and it reads, Thus Solomon finished the house of Yahweh and the king's house, and all that came in Solomon's heart to make it a house of Yahweh. And in his own house he prosperously effected, and Yahweh appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself and my the house of my sacrifices. If I shut up the heavens, there shall be no rain, and or if I um, a yah come, come out a locust and devour the land, or if a yah send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, repent, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. All right. And that is, it's just very clear what the Father promised what we would do. So, if I want to give you this, just say to repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the power of Sonini Nanini Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues, and you can find that reference in Acts chapters 2, verses 38 through 41. Then begin reading in the old King James Version, I recommend, the book of Deuteronomy first, which is in the Old Covenant, then the book of Matthews, which is the New Covenant, then the Revelations, and then the Psalms and the Proverbs. Now, whatever the day's date is, just add 35 times for the Psalms, for the date, and you will have read all the Psalms in a month. Example, if today's date is the 4th, you would just add 34 times, like it would be 33, then 33, 34, then 64, then 94, then 124. And by the end of that, you would have the end of the month. You've been uh, finished reading the entire Psalms and the Proverbs. So I want to say thank you for joining me here at um, uh, Try Me, or Try Me, the Restoration of Yaakov's Unity. Uh, continues, and you've been listening to Dottie, the Bantu prophetess, and join me again next time as we bring about some words of encouragement to help you walk strong in your faith to meet the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes, because he is coming. And I, I just say keep on looking up, and please don't forget to pray for the peace of Africa. Those who pray for her will prosper. You will prosper when you begin to pray for the peace of Africa. So I love you guys. Take care. Shalom, shalom. Remember, there are only two kinds of people. 
Those who do good, Ubantu, sons of the almighty Sonini Nanini, Yahweh, I am that I am, light, and those who do evil, Cain, sons of Lucifer, mother of lies, murderer, destroyer, thief, the original albino, darkness. See you next time for Try You See with Dottie the Bantu Prophetess. Shalom.